All right. Well, thanks uh, for having me today on the Passive House Accelerator. Um, my presentation is called Don't Judge a House by Its Cover, uh, telling a different story about where buildings come from and why that matters. So the premise of this presentation is that more than ever before, uh, we live in a visual culture or a screen culture, and that really dominates people's experience. And the story that plays out on our screens can go a long way towards shaping our understanding of the world, including buildings. Um, but as immersive as these screens are, uh, they're flat representations of reality that don't involve the senses of smell, touch, or hearing in space. And these stories can do uh, sometimes obscure or distract from our experiences of natural phenomena uh, that transpire over the course of a day, a year, or even longer time frames. So going back to a storytelling approach, uh, my mom always loves telling people that Good Night Moon was my favorite book uh, as a kid. Back when I was a back when I was a little person, and I would ask her to read it to me over and over again. And thinking about how do we tell a new story about how people can understand and value buildings. And you know, this is a, a premise that I think is also at the heart of what Passive House Accelerator does, uh, because compelling storytelling is a critical medium for catalyzing uh, the zero carbon building that we're all here for. So a good story can make you laugh, make you cry, lift your spirits, and generally spark curiosity about the world. So there's a lot of great storytelling out there on a lot of these topics. Uh, this book, uh, Material Health and Design Frontiers from the Parsons Healthy Material Lab, uh, collects a lot of these essays and stories. And I uh, kind of took a little chunk of uh, this essay, Decarbonizing Materials and Climate, uh, that I want to share uh, today with you guys to kind of set the tone. So this is from Charlotte McCurdy. And this story is called Ancient Sunlight by Charlotte McCurdy. I like to think about carbon in terms of sunlight. Until about 150 years ago, humans met their needs for light, heat, transport, food, and materials with the energy from the sun. But in the last 150 years, we've built a dependence on ancient sunlight. Fossil fuels are also the secondary energy of the sun, but much more delayed in time. And when we use fossil fuels, either by burning them for energy or extracting and manipulating them into useful molecules, we release that stored ancient sunlight and that stored ancient carbon. I became obsessed with the question of what it would feel like to live in a society that was back in a present tense relationship with the sun. We take fossil fuels out of the long-term carbon cycle and pump them into the short-term carbon cycle. The short-term carbon cycle is what all life lives within and what humans historically use to build our societies. The goal is not to literally decarbonize. The fact of the matter is that we are carbon and life is carbon. In fighting climate change, we need to decide how we use our carbon, which carbon we use, where we want to take it from, and where is a good place for it to go. So moving on to our next story, uh, inspired by the uh, classic question, where do babies come from? Where do buildings come from? And why does it matter? So inspired by these books, which I'd encourage you to screenshot, I found where building materials come from really shapes a building's climate impact. And where do buildings come from? Nature's carbon library. 
Now, there are three primary branches of this carbon library. Farms, forests, and mines. Now, farms move sky carbon into plant fiber. It's kind of like the carbon checking account. And the carbon building block time frame here is less than a year. So in three to 12 months, we have a raw material that we can use as a building block for making a home. Now forests move sky carbon into trees. It's kind of like the carbon savings account. And the carbon building block time frame here for a softwood in particular is usually 30 to 100 years. Now mines move old ancient mineral carbon into commodities and sky carbon. And significant energy is required to extract and process this mineral carbon. And so the time frame here is hundreds of thousands of years, even millions of years. So this is kind of like the carbon buried treasure. So here, to kind of put these ideas in one image, we have our farms and forests over on the left, our plant-based materials. And then over on the right, we have our mineral-based materials. And this is showing a cross-section of the Earth's crust, where these materials are harvest for, harvested from. And sort of up in the sky, up above, you're seeing a representation of the carbon emissions typically uh, involved with manufacturing and harvesting these materials. So why do we love mineral-based building materials? So mineral-based materials tell a story about magic, indestructibility, technology, and power. And this is something that is deeply rooted in the history of architecture from a building like the Taj Mahal that shows great power and kind of and magic. And kind of moving into the 20th century where we're picking up with you know this ad, let this magic mineral asbestos protect the buildings on your farm. It's fireproof, it's rock proof, practically indestructible. Or thinking about the pride in the technology of creating something like plastic saran wrap. Uh, so this advertisement from the 50s is showing all of the different kind of processes and kind of refinement of petroleum products that's required to create a product like saran wrap. And more in, in popular culture, in the Marvel universe, got a magic minerals, indestructible minerals like adamantium, vibranium, or infinity stones are kind of common currency in uh, in our life. And for all the architects out here, out there, uh, this building, the Barcelona Pavilion by Mies van der Rohe, I feel like also kind of shows a similar. Uh, kind of fascination with the kind of magic uh, and permanence shown by mineral-based materials. So how can we tell a new story with plant-based materials? So building materials from farms and forests capture carbon from the sky and store it for decades, making positive climate impact building possible. So here, building materials from farms and forests can store carbon, see this carbon storage green area under the line, from a cradle to gate perspective for the life of the building all the way to the end of life when that biomass eventually would decay. 
So there's five categories of carbon storing plant-based materials. This is from Build Beyond Zero, New Ideas for Carbon Smart Architecture. And there's timber, which we'll talk more about and think everybody's familiar with. But there's another four categories that are kind of, I think, less, uh, less considered. One is agricultural residues and byproducts. Uh, so straws, kind of the best example here. And so this is a plant material that we're already growing that has no food value uh, that can be used as a useful building block for making a home. So companies like New Frameworks, Croft, are doing really amazing work with structurally insulated straw bale panels that are carbon negative, uh, that straw can be harvested locally. Uh, and it's a really kind of fantastic uh, new development in uh, carbon smart construction. Then we have purpose-grown crops. So these are crops that are cultivated specifically or protected specifically for their value as building product, products. And so here we've got hemp, pork, bamboo, uh, linseed, seaweed. So hemp wool made by Hempitecture uh, is a great example here where Hempitecture is working with hemp growers in Montana and is now fabricating hemp wool in Idaho. So it's a domestically produced carbon negative insulation. And then we've got waste stream fiber. So our economy is overflowing with stocks of waste stream fiber. Uh, so there's materials like uh, rich light, which is made from recycled paper. Uh, the table I'm you know, kind of presenting on, the countertops behind us are, are made out of rich light. And also wood fiber insulation, which takes waste stream fiber from existing sawmills and use it to make useful bat blown in and rigid board insulation. So here talking a little bit about timber HP wood fiber insulation, which uh, I'm imagining a lot of you guys are familiar with. They're taking waste from solid sawn lumber processing and then turning it into non-toxic, high performance carbon negative insulation in fill, bat, and board form factors with interesting kind of performance benefits that have to do with the density of using a, um, a biogenic fiber for the, for the insulation rather than a foam or a foam or a stone um, that kind of creates a heat transfer delay, which I won't get into too much. Um, but kind of new materials coming from waste fibers that have interesting performance properties. And the last uh, last category, lab grown fibers, so like the little ones. So bacteria, like mushrooms or mycelium, algae uh, offer great promise for kind of creating or being carbon storing materials, uh, particularly that can replace uh, plastics or foams uh, and adhesives. So how can we tell a cooling story through architecture? So when I was kind of working or planning uh, the project that I'm about to start talking about, uh, I was reminded of uh, my days running a farmer's market uh, where I met my wife. Um, and then this book, Food Rules, an Eater's Manual by Michael Pollan. So in this book, Michael Pollan posits an easy rule, kind of short rule, uh, for eating in a way that's beneficial for your own health and also beneficial for the ecosystems that you're a part of. And this rule is eat real food, not too much, mostly plants. So in planning this project, I thought about extending this to you know, kind of architecture and building so what about build with real materials, not too many, mostly plants? So real, as in not heavily processed, so like vegetables and wood, not Fritos and foam. Or in other words, no home Twinkies. So what does a not too many, mostly plants house look like? 
So the typical solution here in Austin, if we we're doing a foundation, it was usually a concrete slab. Framing would be wood frame. Insulation is frequently spray foam. Cladding is often fiber cement or hardy. Wallboards, jip board, flooring is concrete and wood. So if you look at the material sources for these things, concrete slab is mineral, wood frame is plant, spray foam mineral, fiber cement mineral, drywall mineral, wood floor potentially, um, you know, plant if you have a wood floor. And right now the likely end of life for those materials is concrete slab, likely landfill, wood frame, recycle or biodegradable if it isn't contaminated with spray foam. Spray foam, microplastics, fiber cement, landfill, drywall, landfill, wood or slab, potential biodegrading or landfill. So thinking about a way to uh, bring kind of new material technology to, um, you know, sort of to this place, I started looking at mass timber and plant-based insulation like cork, hemp, and wood fiber. And for this project, uh, I came up with a kind of climate-driven, mostly plants approach, where we did a foundation that was a steel pile and beam. So that's a mineral-based, high embodied carbon material, but very high recycled content and very likely to be recycled at end of life, even, even today. And then for framing, wallboard, flooring, and insulation, kind of an insulation assist really, uh, is cross laminated timber. And then for a wall insulation and cladding, we have cork as an all in one uh, continuous insulation and cladding. And then for roof insulation, we have hemp wool bats and wood fiber insulation. So here's the wall assembly uh, that the house was built off of and was kind of uh, sort of genesis point for the project. This is like kind of a plant based uh, perfect wall approach. So you can see we've got two inches of 100% cork bark. Uh, the product, uh, the cork insulation is literally 100% cork bark. Um, it's a carbon negative product. And then on the inside, we have four inches of uh, solid wood. So four inches of cross laminated timber. Uh, so sustainably harvested softwood. Uh, and then sandwiched in between, we have our air and water control layer, a self-adhered uh, vapor shield, wrap shield SA in this case. So in general, uh, sometimes I describe this uh, enclosure or uh, building approach as sort of big wood box on top of a steel, you know, basically concrete free steel frame foundation. And so we assembled uh, these prefabricated panels um, that arrived from the factory. It was about 50, uh, 50 total pieces. Uh, so we put them, you know, put them in place. And so it facilitated a quicker kind of assembly timeline. Uh, so we were able to get this house built um, and dried in uh, in 10 days. Um, and then it also facilitated uh, kind of an easier uh, kind of an easier approach to air tightness. Uh, we didn't go for a passive house certification on this uh, on this project, uh, but I believe this would be a passive house kind of uh, passive house compatible approach. Uh, the ACH on this uh, on this house, we need to do a final kind of blower door, but uh, was about 1.4 um, when we did uh, did our blower door uh, after kind of everything was installed. Um, but you can see we put this uh, put this house together like a you know huge piece of huge piece of furniture essentially. And then after we got this wood box in place, and you can see the thinness of the structure. So that wall, uh, that roof panel is spanning 18 feet in some places and is only three and a half inches thick. Uh, and the floor panels that match that 18 foot span are five and a half inches thick. So all structural panels that are exposed to the inside um, and in being exposed to the inside, uh, the walls and roof are, or the walls and ceiling are unsealed. And then the floor is sealed with a uh, linseed oil. And so this is what kind of it all came uh, came out as the big wood box monoslope roof blanket it with carbon negative plant based insulation. 
So talking about Quark uh, a little bit on this uh, story uh, side of things, um, it Quark kind of kind of looks like stone in some ways. Um, it insulates like foam, cuts like wood. It's hydrophobic. It maxes about at an eight percent moisture content. Uh, it's again literally one hundred percent cork bark, carbon negative material, zero toxins. Uh, and on the story note, quickly, um, cork was actually the first insulation product in uh, marketed in the U.S. I believe um, the patent came from the eighteen nineties uh, in New York. And Armstrong, the same company that makes uh, acoustical ceiling tiles, carpet, uh, they started out in the 1860s as a cork company and then started making this expanded cork board insulation in around 1900. So these um, kind of guides from the 1920s show sort of detailed, uh, and in this case, so sort of like continuous insulation approach to using cork board in a house. Uh, this house shown here in San Antonio, um, and it's kind of wild because at that time, the other possible materials that we'd use were all kind of plant-based or biogenic uh, in some way. So we got here, this uh, fire test in that guide, it's comparing cork board to sugarcane fiber, eelgrass, wood pulp, vegetable fiber, cattle hair. Um, so there is uh, this sort of history of plant-based insulations in the U.S., um, but uh, Armstrong, among among other companies, shift it to using materials like asbestos, fiberglass. This uh, ad is ridiculous. I mean, I'm sure some of you guys have installed fiberglass and have not enjoyed tea and cookies while you're installing fiberglass. And then foams. So cork is really interesting because they harvest the bark off the tree every eight to nine years. The trees live 200 and 250 years, and they've been doing this process by hand for centuries. So what's the actual difference in carbon impact between the typical and mostly plants approaches? So if we look at that typical slab on grade, drywall, spray foam, hardy, um, I use the beam calculator from Builders for Climate Action to uh, estimate the cra cradle to gate carbon emissions for that approach. And that's up here at 100%, about 27,000 kilograms of carbon dioxide emitted. Uh, then I looked at a slightly kind of reduced approach, but still using these sort of typical materials we're using a pure and beam reducing concrete and that reduced things to 26%. If we go to that carbon smart, mostly plants approach that brings things down to 26% of that kind of maximum possible scenario. And then when we include or estimate the biogenic carbon storage of the CLT um, and biogenic carbon storage with mass timber is a big topic that I'm not going to get into. Um, but when you, when you include that potential carbon storage, then you're looking at a negative 19,000 kilograms carbon dioxide emitted. So how can architecture tell a story about plant-based materials through sight, smell, and touch? So transitioning a little bit, uh, in the course of this project, starting out thinking a lot about carbon and material health, uh, I became very uh, attracted to and passionate about biophilic design. And this report in particular, uh, 14 Patterns of Biophilic Design, kind of lays out um, tools or strategies for using biophilic design uh, in a space. And I'm going to use these to kind of um, or kind of demonstrate these by walking through the house. So Terrapin Bright Green uh, did this report. Great report. So quickly, biophilia is humans' innate biological connection with nature. It helps explain why crackling fires, crashing waves captivate us. A garden view can enhance our creativity, um, our relationship or kind of like love for, um, for pets and animals. 
And biophilic design, uh, design that kind of provides a, that kind of sense of connection with nature has been shown to reduce stress, improve cognitive function, creativity, and just generally improve our well, well-being and expedite health or kind of improve health. And above all, biophilic design must nurture a love of place. So here in the report, uh, the report kind of compiles lots of different scientific studies that show how these different phenomenon can create perceived improvements in mental health and tranquility, positively impacted cognitive performance, reduce stress, increase feelings of tranquility, lower heart rate and blood pressure, positively impacted circadian system functioning, improved perception of temporal and spatial pleasure. And then, you know, these phenomenon, again, like blood pressure, creative performance, reduction in stress, inducing a strong pleasure response. So kind of moving through the space, uh, when you're looking at the house, here we've got this strong visual connection with nature. Um, the cork, uh, you know, the cork, but the other materials is a very strong sense of non-rhythmic sensory stimuli, which is kind of sunlight falling on the on the house and similarly kind of dynamic and diffuse light and also a little bit of a sense of mystery. So as you get closer to the house, um, one of the things I love about this project and something I'm obviously passionate about is that it sort of forces people to think like, what's, what's in my walls? What are my buildings made out of? And having the cork right here at the kind of front entry is something where everybody, no matter who comes to the house, and we've had a few tours, we have a, we've had thousands of people at the house, literally, everybody comes up and touches the cork and mostly like, wow, is this cork? Um, so that kind of number nine sort of material connection with nature is something that's really impactful with the exterior experience and then kind of continues to the interior. Um, so as you walk into the space, um, again, you have that material connection with wood. So the first thing that people kind of talk about when they are usually say when they walk into this space is that they're like, wow, like this house smells good. I feel like I'm in a forest. I don't know, like, how does the house smell so good? Um, and I think that uh, which is effectively a biophilic design strategy is really kind of uh, a great foundation for starting to talk to people about thinking about material health and carbon impact of materials. So here we've got kind of this extended view into the main space. Um, this concept of mystery uh, and prospect is about like, like anticipation, kind of like being curious about what's coming next uh, which is similar to experiences that could happen on, on a hike or in nature. Uh, so then here in the main space, uh, highlighting a bit, like, so all of these cross laminated timber panels, um, or pretty much all of them are structural. Um, so up to the left, the uh, cross laminated timber panel that's running uh, kind of like a huge beam is actually a big structural beam supporting the entry, entry hall. Uh, to the right, these kind of columns, this kind of uh, panel with a curved opening is actually structural and supporting the edge of that roof panel. So a sense of the order and kind of hierarchy in the space. Uh, biomorphic form. So these curved shelves and curved windows that are in the space. And again, throughout the sense of kind of dynamic, uh, dynamic and diffuse light. And moving or coming kind of back, coming back to the stairwell moment that's behind me, uh, there's a view of a sort of spec house just to the uh, behind this wall. So we didn't put any windows on that wall, uh, but we brought in. I put a large skylight up at the top that brings a lot of non-rhythmic kind of sensory stimuli during the day. So it's things that uh, happen like basically just sunlight entering in the space that is very, very kind of positive stimulus for your, uh, for your system. 
And there's also a sense of risk and peril uh, with this kind of moment where there is a sort of lightness of the structure. This kitchen panel is only three and a half inches thick and it is just barely notched into the uh, kind of the end panel. Uh, so this sense of like risk and peril where uh, you're, there's like, okay, how is this thing held up is also something that's identified in that biophilic design report. So then moving through the rest of the space, again, uh, this material connection of nature, uh, it's a bringing uh, materials and elements from nature that have been minimally processed and create a distinct sense of place. So a space with a good material connection with nature feels rich, warm, and authentic, and sometimes you know stimulating to the touch as well. Uh, so here, this uh, bay, want, bay window or this kind of bird watching nook, as we, uh, um, you know, my daughter and I call it, um, again, you have this sense of prospect and refuge. Uh, so refuge is interesting because uh, sitting with your back uh, against the trunk of a big shade tree is sort of like a classic example of a refuge space, uh, but it's a place for withdrawal from the main flow of activity in which the individuals protect it from behind and overhead. So here's the view when you're actually in that space, and then also bringing into um, the prospect kind of uh, pattern into the you know, into play where you have an unimpeded view over a distance for you know, kind of surveillance of your you know of your location. So moving through the rest of the space. Here in this kind of upstairs, like sleeping loft kind of bedroom, again, that skylight uh, that brings a ton of light into the, into the space and a lot of kind of stimulus. Moving into the other bedroom. The bathroom where we brought the, you know, kind of cork into the, uh, you know, into the space. And the cork is also in the shower, kind of mimicking the uh, external um, wall assembly. And again, the sense of, uh, the sense of mystery. So this is the middle bathroom under the, under the stair where the light from the skylight is coming into the space. Um, but uh, yeah, it creates this mysterious uh, sense to the space. So then again, on the uh, exterior, um, presence of water um, is a big thing. So this uh, kind of simple stock tank pool, because it's facing uh, facing south, brings a really wonderful reflection onto the roof of the space and then all the way into the space, up to, depending on the time of year. I hear you see that. Again, also like a non-rhythmic sensory stimuli. And that is, uh, you know, that is the house. So, so Cross Cabin Build and Supply, I'm the founder of Cross Cabin Build and Supply, which is the sister company to Moon Tower Design Build. And uh, our mission is to make plant-based zero carbon home building mainstream in Texas and beyond. Uh, Cause with what I just showed you with the house, uh, it was very difficult for me to find uh, distribution and representation for cork insulation, wood fiber insulation, hemp. Uh, and at the time, I also didn't see anybody who had used this kind of material in my market in Austin. Um, so we've started this uh, cross cabin supply to uh, represent uh, these materials and promote kind of um, this kind of passion for zero carbon plant-based home building in, uh, in our market. So we sell healthy plant-based building materials like Amarim cork insulation, Moffy natural wood floors, Alchemist paint, which is an entirely plastic free, uh, totally mineral paint. It's kind of the same idea with Moffy natural floors. It's a totally zero plastic glue finish uh, approach to a wood floor. Uh, timber HP wood fiber insulation, hemp wool insulation, and more. Uh, so here's my uh, email address and our Instagram. Please reach out to me if you have any questions.
and thank you so much for uh, for allowing me to give this uh, give this presentation. It's really um, it's really a pleasure. Great, Greg. Thank you very much. Great presentation. Beautiful building. Um, uh, Shannon, you got the questions all lined up. Do you have anything you want to want to ask? Uh, we do question. have, yeah, we do have lots of questions, but I think we're going to move to sponsors first and then come back and go down the list because there's, there's a ton. So Greg, thank you. Fantastic presentation. And uh, we'll hand it off to Zach. Great. Thank you, Shannon. And yeah, Greg, that was super inspiring. Really, really well done. Um, so I want to just take a moment to thank the fine organizations that make our work at Passive House Accelerator possible. So a big thank you to our stakeholder partner, NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Also to our founding sponsors, 475 High Performance Building Supply, Ingui Architecture, Glavel, Minitaire, Partel, Rockwell North America, Stocorp, and Zola Windows. Also thank you to our champion sponsors, Buizo, Gradient, Icon Windows and Doors, Intelligent Membranes, PH Air Seal and Source 2050. And thank you to our patron sponsors, Brennan Brennan, Euroline Windows, Holstrom System, Inotech Windows and Doors, Lamalux, Longboard, RDH Building Science, and Sanderson Sustainable Design. Thanks, Zach, and thanks to all our fantastic sponsors who make this possible. Um, Greg, I really love the design, build, and supply approach and the deep dive into all of the metrics, all of the biophilic benefits. Fantastic, right right in my wheelhouse. Kevin, you said you had a question. Why don't we kick off with yours and then we'll jump into the list. Just uh, which manufacturer of CLT panels who'd you work with? Who do you, you know? Sure. Uh, it was uh, Structural Lamb at the time. Uh, Structural Lamb is now kind of has been bought by Mercer. Um, so Mercer has three plants um, throughout North America, one Arkansas, Canada, and then uh, one in Washington. So. Okay, cool. So these panels, they were produced in Arkansas or? These panels, uh, well, these panels were produced in Canada. Um, and at the time I was excited about their kind of Arkansas plant was in process. So I was excited about kind of establishing a partnership with them and then being able to source panels from Arkansas. Um, so uh, yeah, we're doing another uh, another few projects right now that are sourced with Southern Yellow Pine, which would be a regional kind of a uh, regional softwood uh, timber uh, in this area rather than, uh, rather than this Douglas fir and spruce. Beautiful. All right, well, let's jump right into questions. Our first question up is from David Holzbar. David, would you like to unmute and ask your question? And I'm happy to ask it for you. David asks, what is the feeling on stone and brick and mineral wool? What about NFP 285? And he's not here to explain that question any further. Greg, does that make sense to you? Is that one you sure. are yeah, up for answering? Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, uh, uh, brick and stone are going to be uh, that uh, infographic I showed with that kind of cross section of the Earth's crust. I mean, brick and stone are going to have the least amount of, or going to be on the least amount of carbon emissions associated with uh, a mineral based material. And they're also um, kind of not really uh, synthetic, uh, you know, kind of synthetic materials. Um, yeah, when you're talking about, uh, when you're talking about mineral wool, um, I think, um, you know, big things, big things there are insulation is the biggest, um, there's kind of one of the biggest opportunities to actually store carbon in a building. So materials like hemp, pork, straw, wood fiber, uh, these are all carbon negative, uh, carbon negative insulations that perform really, uh, perform really well or vapor permeable. Um, yeah. And really the only, um, yeah, as far as NF, uh, NFP 285, I mean, that applies more to kind of commercial, uh, kind of commercial buildings, uh, corks, a class B, uh, fire rated, uh, fire rated material. Um, so, uh, we're looking at a project in, uh, in California right now. And kind of, if you have a class A fire rated material behind the class B, um, I believe that could be possible, but that's still kind of, 
uh, is in process and is outside of my expert, you know, sort of expertise. Good answer. Thank you, Greg. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to David for that. Prescott, you had kind of a comment and then it ended in a question. Did you want to unmute and throw that out there? Yeah, actually, I had another question that's like a proper question. Um, what was the roof exterior made from? Yeah, the roof ex uh, exterior is a, a paint roof uh, kind of galvalume uh, roof. So it's a, it's a metal it's a metal roof. Okay, yeah, that was the only one missing, and and then that could be recycled at the end, I suppose. Yes, yeah, cool. more likely to be you know kind of recycled than than asphalt. Although asphalt shingles do have a lower, lower carbon impact, but it's anyways, um, yeah, yeah. You're talking to a recycling guy, so I, I don't mind. Um, I, the other comment I didn't even prepare to like talk about it was about reclaiming insulation, right? Mineral wool was that the question, Shannon? That you spotted. I mean, I'm just talking in the chat, but yes, yeah. Have you? Do you know if they're if any of the fiberglass or mineral wool people are reclaiming used material? I mean, maybe that's outside the scope I, of this conversation. I, I don't know. I mean, like a part of my inspiration behind doing this is like with Moon Tower Design Build, we've done a lot of remodels, so we did a lot of demo, and like we started the company. You know, we bootstrapped the initial part of the company, so we. We're demoing fiberglass. We were installing fiberglass. We were running across like old rock wool yeah. and installing that stuff kind of sucks. Um, it's itchy. Um, so like kind of, um, yeah, it's just like prioritizing the carbon impact of materials, but then also things that from a health standpoint, um, that's why the declare labels, which I didn't talk too much about, but prioritizing using materials that have declare labels, are red list uh are red list free um and then also to start you know you know pleasant uh pleasant to work with so thanks uh, Scott. thanks Greg. Of, uh, poly poly iso insulation but I, I haven't heard about any rock wool or fiberglass uh recycling uh, be more direct too yeah i think i'd rather get my tea and cookies while i'm installing uh cork than than fiberglass <laughs> 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 or while i'm recycling it um Next question up is from Chris Brown. Chris, would you like to come on, ask your question? Yeah, I'm curious about uh, things like birds and pests and, and you know, lichen, fungus, all those other things that might decide to try to make um, some kind of home out of the cork and um, how that's addressed. Is the cork coated or, you know, is it advised that you keep some kind of stock of replacement cork, you know, has that whole issue dealt with? Sure. Um, yeah, regarding kind of like bug pests or like termites, that kind of thing. Uh, termites like are looking for looking for cellulose. So, you know, cork is cork bark, you know, wood generally is about uh, 70 to 75% cellulose and the remaining 20% is mostly lignin. Uh, cork is interesting because it's a little bit more than 50% suberin, which is the natural kind of hydrophobic binder that holds this kind of 100% natural material together. When it's heated in manufacturing, that suberin liquefies, put it in a mold, the cork granules expand like popcorn. And then when the suberin cool, cools, it holds the whole thing together. Um, but then beyond that 50% suberin, um, I think it's a it's around 20-ish, maybe 25% lign uh, lignin. And there's 10% ish, like or less of like cellulose. So um, because there is not much cellulose uh, and termites, at least here, really, really like wet cellulose, uh, cork will max out at an 8% moisture content. Um, so it really just does not hold that much water. The same volume of cork compared to the same volume of wood, wood is gonna hold 16 times more, more water. So uh, that's also relevant when you're talking about you know, mold, mildew, lichen. Um, there's also naturally like kind of antimicrobial kind of compounds, uh, I believe called phenols. I need to look that up again, but there's not na naturally antimicrobial compounds in the cork. Uh, regarding uh, birds, birds are, I see my buddy uh, Walter with the uh, Mafi Natural Wood Floors uh, uh, with, uh, he's a, a bird watching buddy of mine, but uh, I've seen some and I've heard about uh, issues with uh, some types of woodpeckers, particularly the northern flickers. Uh, it's probably going to be more of an issue in 
rural areas. Um, I can say that cork is an extremely forgiving material to to patch and repair. Uh, we have uh, patched and repaired a few things, not from any sort of pest, uh, other than just kind of, uh, there's some places where we put cork kind of all throughout the house to sort of test its durability. So kids, you know, sort of jumping on it or mostly like kind of corners. Uh, there's things that we've, uh, we've repaired. Um, we also had a mini excavator, like the bucket for a mini excavator hit the corner of the house. And when that happened, it, so it's two inches of solid cork. It did not get to back to the WRB. Uh, some chunks of cork about the size of like two of my fists kind of fell off the building, but it came off in solid pieces. So I was actually able to take those solid pieces and glue it back on the building, kind of puzzle piece style, uh, using uh, basically you know, type on three and like a whole bunch of cork dust. And cork is such an aggressively, it's such an organic material because it's it has so much pattern that most people never even notice. And it's like right on the front corner of the building about eight feet off the ground. Most people never even notice that patch. We just had, you know, 650 people th uh, through here for a tour last weekend. And I think maybe one person mentioned it. <laughs> Amazing. I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, what's, what's the life expectancy of the product? When does it reach end of life? Does it reach end of life? Yeah, so uh, the tested kind of life expense uh, expectancy uh, is 45 to 50 years. And that's basically the, that's the limit of what they can test. Um, you know, there's uh, cork warehouses, like cold storage warehouses that are kind of uh, throughout the U.S., mostly in older cities. Uh, and I have friends who, like a friend in Chicago is like, man, I just keep, went to this cork warehouse or went to this warehouse, it was a concrete warehouse, and it was lined with cork. And that cork kind of comes out, you know, in great shape. In Portugal, they actually recycle a lot of that cork that comes out of older buildings and then put it back in the new cork. Um, so, you know, it's it's 100 percent. There's nothing there's no glues or binders that are kind of a different material to sort of like degrade or start to, you know, it's, um, you know, and, and in nature, the cork bark would hypothetically last for 200 to 250 years easily the lifetime of the tree. Excellent. Thank you. Dean, you're up next. Would you like to come on and ask your question? Yes. Hey, Greg, thanks for um, the presentation. It's a very cool house. I was wanted to piggyback on the roof a little bit and see if you could describe the insulation strategy for, for how you insulated the roof, as well as um, if you used, I was wondering if you were using the Vapro Shield as your air barrier, and if you were, kind of, you could describe how you transitioned that up onto that big panel on the roof. Thanks. Sure. Um, yes, I was using uh, the Vapro Shield, uh, their Slope Shield self-adhered or Slope Shield SA kind of a roof underlayment as my air barrier up there. Um, and then the Wrap Shield SA. Uh, so on two walls, we don't have an overhang. So we were able to kind of like lap the Slope Shield down and kind of adhere it to the Wrap Shield to kind of uh, maintain air barrier continuity. On the two walls with the larger overhangs, we were uh, using uh, the the liquid like the vapor shield liquid flash uh, at that kind of at those edges, uh, which I do think is uh, is a little bit of a vulnerability. We had to do that like kind of really carefully, but um, yeah. Uh, so that that was how we did that kind of from the inside. Uh, yeah, and then on top we have that kind of initial layer of slope shield SA, and then there's a non structural two by eight over roof that we filled with 24 inch on center hemp wool, um, uh, hemp wool insulation. And then we decked that, put another layer of un underlayment on it and then did the, uh, did the metal roof. Beautiful. I, I like that you're in the space that you're talking about. And when you're talking about the roof, you're looking up, <laughs> recalling <laughs> how all of these pieces went together. Um, our next question is from... Carolyn. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Tom. Tom Phillips. Tom, are you with us? Looks like you're here, but if you can't unmute, I will ask there you a there question. We go. Sorry. Great. Um, yeah, a, a great uh, presentation and project. I'd like to hang out there sometime. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was, um, I, I'm wondering about shipping impacts, uh, because when we ordered cork floors about 10, 12 years ago, they ended up sending the wrong model or whatever from Portugal. 
and and the floors are fairly heavy. That's of course different than your insulation product. But they ended up having to, you know, ship another load from Florida or wherever their distributor was from for the Portugal manufacturer. But um, when I checked on it, uh, shipping emissions or uh, for cork insulation, I didn't find much. The looks like cork is generally kind of carbon negative, at least for uh, wine corks and things like that. But that's for Europe, so I don't know about the shipping impacts or not. I always kind of wondered about that one. We had the problem with our flooring. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, when you're talking about kind of shipping, uh, like uh, obviously it would be ideal if like these things were locally sourced. Um, you know, so I lean on like, uh, yeah, the builders for climate action folks, Chris Magwood, uh, Jacob Recruit, and all those, all those guys, uh, when they talk about, uh, cradle to gate, uh, carbon emissions, and then also sort of emitting that transportation piece, they say that transportation usually accounts for five to 10% of the overall kind of, uh, embodied carbon impact delivered to site. Um, so it, it does have a carbon impact, obviously. Um, it is usually less significant than the manufacturing piece of the equation, uh, which is why I was like, okay, I still want to use a material like cork, which is also totally non-toxic, et cetera. Uh, I guess in my mind, and this is just sort of my opinion, it's like, okay, if we're shipping things over in shipping containers, um, it's carbon negative, non-toxic insulation and building products are probably one of the better things to be shipping in shipping containers. Um but um, yeah, like it that uh, in terms of shipping from a carbon perspective, like that's a uh, quick aside on that. Uh, I mean, Fine Home Building did a really nice piece uh, a while back talking about shipping like wood fiber insulation uh, from Europe, which is kind of no longer uh, not really totally necessary anymore since Timber HP is here, which is fantastic. Um, yeah, they uh, and they said still like you can bring in a carbon negative and product like wood fiber insulation and have uh, have it still be carbon negative here. Um, this comes up with the uh, Mafi natural wood floors as well, which is also a carbon negative uh, cradle to gate um, a product that uh, we're, you know represent um, the Texas ambassador for Mafi natural wood floors as well. Um, so um, yeah, that's kind of the carbon uh, carbon part of it. And then, yeah, in terms of avail availability, like I stock certain thicknesses of cork uh, here uh, here in Austin. Um, and uh, yeah, but there's a lot of flexibility with kind of how you can work and cut the cork. Uh, but yeah, you want to kind of stick within a certain thickness. Uh, otherwise it would take me three to four months to get, you know, sort of a, a very specific kind of thickness or pattern. Great. I, that's kind of what I, I guess, but I have a quick follow-up question about carbon negative um, and cork being a great carbon sink. What would it take to make the whole project carbon negative? Because I, I may have missed that part of your presentation. But Thanks, Tom. I'm actually going to put a pin in that question. Yeah. We will ask that question as soon as we get back. Carolyn, I see you're still with us. Would you like to unmute and come on? Hello. I'm just trying to get my video on. There we go. Oh, oh, geez. Sorry. You're looking at my ceiling. Sorry. About that. <laughs> um, first, yeah, really, um, I love the storytelling. It's such a powerful way to be able to kind of reef. Uh, my question was, we often, you know, clients are looking at either renovating or, or building new. Did you catch that, and, Greg? I, I know, you know it froze it was, a little it was the bit. The comments that you were making, where you said, "Oh yeah, you, you, oh you know what? I bet you my Wi-Fi is not great, so we should take my video off. Otherwise, you might not be able to hear me." I'm sorry. Good idea. Yes, please, <laughs> Carolyn. That'd be fantastic. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Uh, Glad you like the story time. I do. Um, it's it's really a powerful way to help people make decisions or trade offs. Um, and, and one of the things people often talk about is, well, I'd rather build new, it's faster, it's easier, but then there's so much demo. So, you know, we've talked to people about, you know, reuse what you can, like, uh, you know, you can use timber to, to make decking out of, uh, strip out wiring and metals, fine recyclers. But one thing I was curious about was something like concrete. Um, you know, if you're pulling up, um, you know, if you've got, let's say, a foundation and you're trying to dig deeper or you've got leaking in the basement, you kind of have to. Um, you know, I, I when I was looking at your negative numbers, I thought, huh, 
is it actually better to try to reuse that kind of material knowing that if you can if you find someone and they have to remanufacture it is that actually better or worse than just saying you know what you know just do it differently because i'm i do often recommend renovation first although it can be a bit of a pain but your numbers make me wonder a bit about that so the question is is it better to reuse mineral and fossil fuel based materials over brand new plant-based ones, or do the plant-based ones offset so much that it's um, a wash? Is that a accurate reinterpretation? Okay, great. Thank you, Carolyn. Yeah, so I, uh, I think reuse, um, I, mean, I, I think reuse is always, always fantastic. Uh, I mean, I think in terms of like thinking about renovations, um, I would, yeah, obviously, like you'd go down the like definitely want to make sure there's no bulk water issues. If you don't have any bulk water issues, then what's I usually think about like, okay, what's your air barrier? And then after you get to the end of the air barrier, then you start getting to uh you know, sort of getting start getting the thermal. Um, if you're able to have a good um, you know, air uh insulation, like in kind of existing mineral-based insulation is often in the way of installing um a quality air barrier, although not always, it's just the kind of layers of the onion sort of like situation. Um, so I think um, you know, I like we're re using mineral-based materials like concrete, like totally, you know, totally fantastic. Um, maintaining mineral-based materials that might have um some like toxicity uh you know uh could be you know could be fine but it's it could be fine if they're it sort of depends where your air barrier is like how are you protecting how are you protecting your your kind of fishbowl uh fishbowl of air as i often uh often uh call it and you kind of keeping you know things like fiberglass you know for instance like keeping those fibers out of um you know sort of out of the space where you're good point you're yes yeah and I, the classic uh answer it depends <laughs> yeah um, yeah no I, I agree. And I, we tend to say, use those re reused materials outside, especially when people really want a concrete patio. Well, dig it up from your foundation. That That's cracked. <laughs> I, I reused a lot of materials on this project. Uh, oh, nine, great. Nine out of 10 windows were reused. The bracing that we used for the CLT. That's excellent. Two thirds of the deck. Um, I reused all, or the, a lot of this uh, dug for one by was left over for a job. Most of the stairs are like re kind of reclaimed wood um and i could go on but i will stop so perfect well thank you for the the thorough answer and the great question i just, just want to um, make uh, actually hang on carolyn give me one sec here because we do have a bunch of people waiting in the queue and we are running out of time so i just want to make a quick point that try to keep these brief so that we can get through them all and give everybody a chance to ask a question of Greg. I'm actually gonna skip mine and uh, head straight to Taylor. Taylor, would you like to come on and ask your question? Uh, just a quick question because normally in the building department in New York, we, we're facing the bracing of the roof and the bracing components and I didn't see any of yours. <laughs> Yeah, so like bracing in terms of like lateral high wind, high wind issues. Yeah, uh, I mean the uh, the roof, you know, the roof panels are kind of continuous, like twenty three and a half foot long panels that are all screwed off to the cross laminated timber walls. Um, mostly all screwed off with like six and a half inch, uh, six and a half inch screws. Um, the whole roof is screwed on to the cross laminated timber below. Um, yeah. So with the roof in particular, like that's, you know, sort of that's it. Uh, there's bracing like in terms of wind with the connection of the wall panels to the steel foundation, there's kind of pull downs in uh, eight or 10 places. Um, so um, yeah. Thank that you. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you for that. Our next question is from Maria. Maria, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yes, thank you. First of all, I just want to say thank you so much, Greg. That's super inspiring. And I think my next home definitely should be plant-based. Um, I would love it to be. 
Um, I'm in New York and I have a team. We're working with a developer. We're getting ready to launch a passive house condo project. Um, we work at Compass Real Estate. Yay. <laughs> and they, um, but really, my question is from more of a consumer standpoint, because I, I love everything um, that you had discussed. And what sort of price would you put? I mean, approximate price to, you know, if I wanted to do a prefabricated home similar to the one you did. Um, you know, what, what would that cost someone? Yeah. Um, I think somebody shared a link to a, a recent dwell article that we did. Um, but okay. this project again would be about, you know, 450, basically 450 to $500,000 in our market. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, so it kind of varies with, um, sort of varies with labor. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, you know, uh, that, that, like, that's what I'd, I'd say in terms of cost, uh, some of, you know, the, the cork has some cost benefits in terms of not needing to be finished. It's your, you know, and it's continuous insulation. Uh, we're doing a few, um, we're doing a passive house project in Houston where they're going to be using cork. Uh, cork is a continuous, uh, you know, kind of continuous insulation layer and exposed final finish. Uh, when you get in a passive house, continuous insulation assemblies, it can be a pretty, uh, cost effective, um, a cost effective approach. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, I think, um, yeah. And with this approach too, like those cross, like these cross laminated timber, like structural panels are exposed as your, you know, final floor, for instance, and obviously like the final finish, like elsewhere. Um, so in talking about the project, I frequently say like, Hey, like really stripping out, um, or kind of limiting your palette. Like there's no drywall in this whole house. There's no latex paint. There's no polyurethane. Uh, there's, you know, there's, it, it's a very, like we took a lot, there's no overhead lighting, for instance, uh, the mm -hmm. lights, like there's a, uh, it took a very different approach to, um, it, you know, it's one of the things that contributes to making the house feel so different than a typical house, which is intentional because it feels different enough that people are like, man, like, what is this? And I want people to ask questions because I want people to be like, wait, like, okay, well, where does this building come from? Like how, like, what are the health impacts of materials? Like I, I want those questions. So that's one of the reasons I did it. I also, I also like, I mean, I like the way it feels, but, um, got it. Great. That thank you. All right, thanks for yes, your time. It, it did. And, and, and even more. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Maria. Excellent. Leah, would you like to unmute and ask your question? You're next up. Looks like actually Leah has left the room. Her question was, how do we ensure with deforestation uh, that we can increase the use of wood without degrading our forests? Uh, great, yeah, great question. I think um, there's a really excellent Building Green report that has came out with part one, and I think part two is coming out, uh, that talks about um, these issues. Um, the forest inventory, like generally the forest inventory and the forest area in North America has increased since the fifties. So I've that's, heard that. big, yeah. that, that's a, that's a big win. The carbon question is more complicated than that because it's like, okay, what happens to the carbon in the roots? Like what happens to the, car like, um, so I would say you need to read reports like that. I would not like kind of pose like uh cross laminated timber, uh, for instance, as a you know, silver bullet material. That's just like, okay, this is like carbon. Like it, it has, it feels amazing in here. I will definitely say, say that I do think there's carbon benefits and like kind of talk, you know, non-toxic, uh, non-toxicity benefits. But I think the biggest thing, like I, I would prefer like be curious, read reports, continue learning, um, is, um, is that's a amazing. I totally agree. And if you haven't seen the hidden life of trees, that will give you a whole new perspective on, how wood is uh, sustainably forested and not. Our next question up is from George. George, would you like to unmute and ask your question? I'm not sure if George is still with us. Well, we will skip over George for the moment and head to Doran. Doran, would you like to come on and ask your question? Okay, can you hear me satisfactorily? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, my first question is about cork in the shower. It just sort of seems counterintuitive putting a uh, wood product as your shower uh, lining instead of tile or whatever. 
Um, and I'd like you to elaborate on that. And one more thing is that I'm in Seattle and moss and algae grow on everything in the winter time uh, because everything's constantly wet. Uh, how will this material do as an exterior in a constantly wet environment? Sure. We answered that a little bit before, Greg, but if you want to take another. Yeah, I'll, um, yeah, I'll, I'll answer it Yeah, kind of quickly. Uh, regarding the shower, like, so yeah, it is, cork is bark. It is not wood. They're both from trees, but the bark has a very different property. If you look at bark under a microscope, it is a closed cell structure. It's essentially a natural foam. Uh, and it does not, it, it maxes out at an 8% moisture content. And then the cork itself is also uh, anti, you know, sort of antimicrobial. Uh, we have two cork showers now. They're both holding up fantastically well. Um, I like, yeah, they're both holding up, holding up fan, uh, fantastically well. Um, yes. So um, when you talk about like mold, mildew, things that you'd see in like the, the shower like that, like that mold and mildew is going to need water for food. So if the cork doesn't absorb water and then that, you know, the, and it dries quickly, that's a major benefit. And then if the substrate is also naturally antimicrobial, that's also a huge benefit. I've not seen a bit of mold or mildew on either, either of the two, two showers, which have been in uh, service for like probably over eight months, um, over eight months now. Um, and, uh, Can I ask a crazy question, Greg, how do you clean it? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, cleaning it, we've, uh, yeah, just kind of a, like a Myers or like a simple, like kind of citric, you know, kind of lemon, like, uh, Perfect. thank you. Cleaner. I just had to ask, <laughs> yeah, uh, something basic, a natural um, cleaning product that's citrus based. <laughs> yes. Uh, and then, uh, I forget, there was another part of the question. I, for, I forgot what that was. Oh, um, Exterior, uh, constantly wet. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. Again, yeah. The, the hydrophobic thing, it maxes out at an 8% moisture content at 100% relative humidity. So uh, there are cork projects in uh, in Seattle. There's a cork project in Alaska. Uh, I have heard, you know, zero, like uh, Small Planet Supply, who just, you know, distributes uh, thermocork there in, you know, there in Seattle uh, or outside of, or in Tumwater. Um, they have a cork project that's been up for 10 years. Um huh. I'll, I'll, ask, oh. I'll ask them about that. Yeah. Um, and then there's the, there's panel joints in the shower. Water, it seems like, would just get between the joints and go back to the substrate and uh, do bad things to the house. Yeah, the uh, basically the assembly of the shower is a mimic of the assembly for the outside. It's basically inch thick cork. It is just liquiflashed to the wall. There's no screws. Um, so it's going to just go back and hit the you know, effectively the shower WRB. Um, and, uh, yeah. So. so no worries there. Excellent. All right. Our last question up is from Brian Hicks. Brian, thank you for being so patient and for everyone else for hanging out for this final 15. We are just up, up against it. So Brian, welcome. Brian is not here to ask his question. He here asked... I'm here. Oh, great. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Shannon. Um, hey, Greg. I don't know if you can speak to that, but on these uh, wood and plant fiber um, insulation materials, how is rodent infestation deterred or minimized when using them? Sure. I don't know um, if you can speak to that. Yeah, generally, like if they're in places where there's more of kind of a potential for uh, for access, um, like when wood fiber, hemp fiber, uh, there's boric, basically boric acid, uh, generally in, um, in those, uh, in those bat, uh, in those bat products, uh, and in the loose fill in terms of the timber HP loose fill. Um, yeah, with, uh, with cork, um, yeah, I have not seen any rodents take, I haven't seen any rodents taken, taken interest in it yet. Again, like that, uh, I believe some of the, like, it's supposed to be pretty, hard to digest uh the cork bark but yeah i mean we we haven't seen any um any interest from any of the um the rodents also all the walls are solid so there's just not that many you know there really aren't um many cavities to no no points of entry yeah. right yeah. Yeah. yeah that's yeah no points of entry is more of the more of the approach so. well but you you've given our... it could be a I'm sorry. But yeah, boric, boric acid, acid um, I believe is in um, 
it's for sure in timber hp's uh, timber bat and i believe it's in the hemp wool bats but that's kind of frequently used as a it's, it's more used for fire um but i believe it also um would have some anti um pest I, I, i'm not positive about anti-rodent kind of properties but i think that i think that's a relevant point so thank you thank you brian uh thank you for asking that question and Greg, thank you so much for your presentation today. You have given all of our designers and builders and suppliers a lot to think about. And I hope everyone takes to heart the uh, the lessons learned today. I know I'm going to grab some of the books that you're reading, go to some of the links that you shared, and look forward to thinking more about using some cork on my projects. So please uh, give Greg a round of applause if you're still hanging out. And... Please come back and, and show us your Passive House project as soon as you've got something to show. We'd love to have you back. Thanks so much. Uh, yeah, uh, Shannon, Kim, uh, Zach, thanks for the invitation. This is this was a lot of fun. Um, and everybody for the great feedback and excellent questions. A beautiful project and a fantastic presentation. Yeah, thanks, great Greg. Job. Great job, Greg. Great Thank job, you. Greg. All right. All right. We will see everybody next week for Reimagine Buildings 24.